Wondering what Broadway shows to see as the new season gears up? Our opinionated panel of experts weigh in on their choices. Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to Theater All the Moving Parts. Joining me for a thrilling look at the jam-packed fall theater season are critics Helen Shaw of The New Yorker and Adam Feldman of Time Out New York. Also, Jan Simpson, theater journalist and host of Broadway Radio's All the Drama. Welcome, Jan. Welcome, Adam. Welcome, Helen. Uh, and I'm so glad for us to be all together again to talk about the fall preview. I want to delve into musicals, but I first want to talk about an off-Broadway transfer that landed like a ton of bricks last July, opening the season, and that is O oh Mary, a five-character, 80-minute play by Cola Scola as a dumb and dipsomaniacal <laughs> Mary Todd Lincoln opposite Conrad Ricamoro's gay and tortured President Lincoln. <laughs> It is doing over a million a week in grosses on Broadway. Um, what gives, Jan? Why? I don't know. Um, it's not my kind of humor, and yet I loved it when I saw it. But when they said it was going to move to Broadway, I said, I don't think that's going to work, which just shows <laughs> I should not be investing in shows because it's, it's been a great hit. Yeah, I mean, it does attack one of the sacred cows. I mean, it's very daring. Uh, you know, President Lincoln is getting service under the yes. yes, but it's so silly. I mean, it, it, it lands like a ton of, it lands like a ton of feathers on Broadway, you know? <laughs> it's just, it's an attack of tickle. It's great. I've been a big fan of Cola Scola's for mm. almost 20 years now. Uh, I think that they're just uh, the bee's knees and have been doing phenomenal work off Broadway and off off Broadway and in comedy clubs and television for a long time. So uh, those of us who've been following Cole have been waiting for this kind of moment, but I don't think even us, I don't think even we an anticipated quite the degree to which it would be uh, you know, accepted by the mass culture. It's shaking the rafters. I've never seen an audience respond so enthusiastically, mm -hmm. Helen. Mm -hmm. Were you familiar with them, with Cola Scola? Yes, although, you know, just before we started uh, filming, we were talking about people who've had second acts in their careers mm -hmm. and in their, in their artistry. And I will say it is my kind of humor. I am a fan of Coles, and I, what I thought when it was downtown is this is so quintessentially downtown. It was at the Lortel. I thought this is perfect for this tiny space. And you know, I, I watched someone conk themselves in the head uh, on the seat in front of them. They were laughing so hard <laughs> down at the Lortel, like they went forward and back, and they had like wounded themselves. Fantastic. And I thought, oh, how could this move to Broadway, as you say? And then it is that that um, moving into another type, which is entertaining a room that big. It turns out Cole's work on YouTube. See, that's not how we stop sweet potatoes. Oh, oh, suddenly you noticed me. Cole's you work in television has prepared them so perfectly to entertain several balconies worth of people. <laughs> and it is one of, I honestly cannot think of a time when I've ever thought this, which is that it's better in a bigger room hmm. because the laughs sort of move tidily. And there's an inspired concept to make Mary Todd Lincoln a wannabe cabaret star. <laughs> sure. Which introduces <laughs> sure. a kind of musical element as well. And I think we have to give credit to the director, Sam Pinkleton, and to Conrad Ricamora. Yes, because it's the whole cast. The, the cast is perfect. It, it's yeah. beautifully structured as well because it just builds and builds. And Sam Pinkleton's a choreographer originally, oh, right? Interesting. I and so, that. and comes out of deep downtown as a choreographer, and is I think that is one reason why this thing is. I mean, it is like the Rockettes level precision, mm. and That's if you see it twice, you realize that things that look like chaos are. Finessed. Yes. It does introduce a thread which is going to weave its way through a lot of what we're about to discuss, and that is the idea of camp. Mm. Uh, I think we'll we'll hit some of those um, 
those uh, notes as we move through. I don't know, could you apply camp to the first of the three revivals? And that is Once Upon a Mattress. I've always been shy. I confess it, I'm shy. Can't you guess that this confident air is a mask that I wear cause I'm shy. Do you think that that kind of fits in? What did you think of this revival? Obviously with Sutton Foster, Michael Urey, as well, the Mary Rogers musical, the 1959 musical, mm -hmm. I think it is. Um, what did you think of it, Jan? Oh, it's great fun. I don't know if it's camp, but it's what Adam was talking about, where you just laugh. It's just silly. And uh, the world is so oppressive maybe right now and I think people are just really welcoming the chance for a couple of hours or even 80 minutes to just sit there and laugh and just not have any worries not be looking for the deeper meaning just to have a good time. Mm. And both of those shows offer a good time. And, and the Ellen, cast in, in Mattress is just a top notch group of funny nuts. And they're just they're just going all out and it's great. Directed great by fun. Lee De Bessonnet. De Bessonnet, yes. De Bessonnet. Yes. Helen, I think you admired Michael Urie's performance. Watching him, he has this wonderful quality as a comedian. He's like an octopus. The intelligence that covers the top half of his body and the intelligence that governs the bottom half of his body are two different brains. <laughs> and so the top of him will be looking sort of normal as the bottom of mm -hmm. him just starts to melt like an ice cream cone. And he does that every time he starts to kind of get woozy with love for Sutton Foster's character. And so it is just watching this sort of upright person just kind of sink into the ground. I It gives me the giggles every time I think about Adams, it. Michael Urie, uh, I've been in the tank for Michael Urie for I a know. long time. Um, but, uh, Sutton Foster's body. And, and, <laughs> well, Sutton Foster, well, let's, you know what, they, they, they've emphasized the comedy in this production. They've given yes. Sutton a couple of big set pieces where yes. she's doing uh, just clowning, just yes. comic business. And uh, they last for minutes at a time and they build with the audience. And when you're talking about the laughter of a large audience, you really feel that in her working the audience, of her sensing what's working and, and keeping it and going, milking it for a little bit longer. And that's really fun to see. In terms of the next uh, musical arrival under discussion, Sunset Boulevard, obviously Norma Desmond has always been a camp figure to a lot of drag queens ever since the 1994 musical based on the Billy Wilder film. This production, however, is minimalist, stripped down, Janie Lloyd, London import. Did anybody happen to see it in London? Or no. it's coming in with a fairly large head of steam uh, to Broadway, starring Nicole Swissinger. Skirtsinger? Thank you. Skirtsinger, thank you, Helen, <laughs> uh, as Norma Desmond. Um, what what are your hopes for it? Because it is very minimalist. It's well, she's, she's, I mean, Norma Desmond has been a camp object since before the 1994 musical. Yeah. She's been a camp <laughs> object she was, since That's the movie why she's in the movie. I mean, yeah. She, she, yeah. in the movie itself, she's a camp object. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that that's what this musical, if I understand it correctly, I didn't see mm -hmm. it in London. If I understand it correctly, that's what they're trying to get away from mm. in this version uh, is uh, the original one with its massive set and costumes and trappings. Uh, and Glenn Close doing a, a big, sort of satisfyingly kabuki performance mm -hmm. uh, was, it, it fell into certain uh, tropes of how we receive that musical. I think this one is trying to uh, reinvent it and make her more modern and more real. Uh, it will be, it'll be interesting to see that. In the same season as we had the Cats revival of a different, mm -hmm. you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, go the opposite direction, take it wildly into the direction of camp, uh, very You're successfully. You're talking about Jellicoe Ball. Jellicoe Ball camp. Right, downtown. Uh, the, the Cats Jellicoe Ball at Perelman Center, which I very much hope will have a future life on Broadway. Which is uh, also great fun. Was phenomenal fun. Phenomenal fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Andrew Lloyd Webber would not allow it to transfer this season because of Sunset to Boulevard. Compete with, yeah. He did not want it to compete with Sunset Boulevard. Cut, so as long cut. as Sunset Boulevard is on, 
Del we won't see Delico Ball. Having Nicole Skirtsinger, who is stunning, playing Norma Desmond, is sort of part and parcel with this season's obsession with, with women saying that they're trying to recapture their youth while already being gorgeous, <laughs> right? Because death becomes her, which is the yeah. same plot. Yeah. It's like The Substance, the movie with Demi Moore in which she has to destroy herself in order to become gorgeous and young. And you're like, you're Hello, Demi Moore. You're you Demi Moore, yeah. <laughs> well, certainly uh, Audra McDonald is gorgeous. Are we gonna buy her as an abusive mother in the revival of Gypsy that is heading towards The Majestic, directed by George Seawolf? A dream about you. It's gonna come true. Yes. This is probably the musical I'm most looking forward to um, because the whole idea of uh, Ro Rose being a black mother in vaudeville and pushing her daughter. And I know there's been some pushback yes. about that, about would there be this kind of family? And let me say, yes, there was. Dorothy Dandridge's mother, hmm. Dorothy Dandridge and her sister were in vaudeville. They had a Mama Rose mama hmm. who pushed them into performing, who pushed Dorothy into a marriage with one of the Nichols brothers who was very abusive to her. This story is a black story as well as just a universal story. And Audra is Audra. She's not just, you know, a great uh, musical person. She's a terrific actress. Well handled it when in The Outsiders, they show us an integrated gang in the <laughs> 1950s in Oklahoma. True. You know, the idea that we apply this this strainer uh, to these experiences very selectively. I, I think it's, uh, anyway, I think I, I find it a little yeah. upsetting. And maybe <laughs> if, if they are, I don't, I, I don't know yet whether they're planning to play the family as black or whether they they're are. planning to, mm -hmm. right, so yeah. if they are, then, then that might add a level of interest to their outsider status within the vaudeville community, mm -hmm. add a level of, um, tragedy, irony to her ambitions to make them stars in a world that they cannot be stars in at that moment. Uh, you know, uh, that, that might be, uh, you know, add interest to a, a show that we've seen many times before. Getting to the original musicals, here's one from South Korea. It's set in Seoul. It is Maybe Happy Ending, starring Darren Chris and Helen J. Shen, directed by Michael Arden. It's a 90-minute, one-act uh, South Korean musical by Will Aronson and Hugh Park. Um, and it's about a couple of help bots who find romance in a futuristic soul. When you're in love, you are the loneliest. You're only half when one is what you were. You're part instead of whole when you're in the I'm very curious about it. this was this was written this was a show that was written in Korean and English uh, simultaneously and uh, it premiered in Korean in Seoul uh, a few years ago and had a quite successful run uh, in well, South Korea. Wasn't it also in Atlanta? And it's been yes, and it was yes, in Atlanta. Yes, yes. Uh, it was in Atlanta a few years later. The, the Asian market in musical theater is huge and expanding, and I'm I'm curious how it will go on Broadway. I, I like the idea of a sci-fi musical. It's just hard to pull off. Yeah, I listened to the Korean cast album, and it's kind of poppy music. Of of, of maybe happy ending. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's kind of poppy music, and so it'll be interesting to see if um, you know. It catches on. Well, talking about poppy music, <laughs> you couldn't get poppier than Louis Armstrong jazz and pop as yeah. well. I mean, one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century by any measure. Mm -hmm. And it's a new musical by Oren Squire, starring James Monroe Idleheart as um, Louis Armstrong. 
and it covers a lot of ground. Now, it has been around before. Mm -hmm. have, have anybody seen it in its previous incarnations? Mm -hmm. And what would you hope that it achieves in terms of, you know, Louis Armstrong's position in American pop culture? Well, I don't think Louis Armstrong needs any help with <laughs> his position um, in our popular culture. Um, people have been trying to do a Louis mm. Armstrong musical for a very long time time. I went to a backers audition back in the early 80s for a very different um, musical, but a Louis Armstrong musical. This one is using the structure of looking at his life through his, I believe, four wives. Right. So I don't know if they were all married, but, they, but for the four main women. women yeah, there were, there were four wives. He had oh, four, four wives four. and many, many lovers as well. And so, you know, so that's interesting. What's worrisome to me about the this is the recent uh, announcement that it's going to have three directors. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of spoons in the bowl. He stayed in the house that he had in Queens for a long time, which I believe is now the Louis Armstrong Museum. Yeah, yeah we, we went out there, my husband and I. My husband's also a trumpet player. So we went out uh, to the house, which is great fun if, if you haven't gone. How does your husband regard Louis Armstrong? You know, um, up and down, because Louis's reputation, I mean, everyone acknowledges he's the, you know, he's the mountain. He's at the summit. Um, in some ways, he helped to create jazz as we know it. But his reputation went down because of when Miles Davis and those guys came on the scene, they didn't want to do the kind of clowning around mm -hmm. that Louis Armstrong did and Cab Calloway did. And there was a feeling that maybe he wasn't as front and center in the civil rights movement as some other black artists were. But I think his reputation has now started to move back up. Um, it'll be interesting uh, to see. I think people who come to see this will be coming to see James Monroe Iglehart. The Tony winner. For, yeah. And, and he's, for he's a terrific performer. Uh, and the word on his performance uh, has been very strong. Louis Armstrong is a titan of jazz and American culture. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. This is the only uh, jukebox musical of the, sea, of the fall. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's a catalog musical. It's, uh, but yeah, so if nothing else, we'll hear James Monroe, Iglehart doing a bunch of really great uh, Louis Armstrong classics. And uh, that seems like it might be enjoyable enough on its own terms. Well, no, did you see Satchmo at the Waldorf? Uh, Is that I, the Terry Teach yeah. Yes. Yeah. With John, John Douglas, Douglas Thompson. Thompson. And that play, which also has this exactly that kind of contestation that you're talking about, is is his sense that he's been eclipsed, but also done done down by by people who think that he hasn't contributed enough to the movement. And um and you, I remember seeing that. It's some years ago, and my memory is faulty, but I do remember thinking, oh, if only there was some more music in this mm -hmm. so that we could actually hear his other voice. So mm -hmm. We mentioned camp a little earlier, and the next up uh, on the musical boards is Tammy Faye, an Elton John musical, of course, about the televangelist Tammy Faye Baker mm -hmm. and Jim Baker, who ran into buzzsaw, respective buzzsaws <laughs> in history. She ran into a, a, a buzzsaw just about the, at first, anti-gay aspects of evangelical Christianity and then became a tremendous supporter herself. Yeah, there's a lot of Christians here who would love you and who wouldn't be afraid to put their arm around you and tell you that we love you and that we care. Thank you, Tammy. God bless you for saying that. And Jim Baker ran into going to jail for fraud as well. It's an Elton John musical. It was uh, tried out and was something of a, of a success in London. What do you know about it, Adam? Uh, well, they're think? bringing the original star over here to, mm -hmm. play the, to play Tammy Faye, but she'll be joined by two 
very established Broadway leading man, uh, Christian Borrell and Michael Service. And Michael Service will be playing Jerry Falwell, their, their nemesis, the Baker's nemesis in the 1980s. Katie think- Braben. Um, yes. is playing to uh, Right. Elton John, of course, has a, a pretty good track record. Mm-hmm. Not not stellar always, <laughs> but a pretty good track record on Broadway. Uh, and uh, and Jake Shears is writing the lyrics. He's the front man for Scissor Sisters, which is a really terrific uh, band that for some reason has more of a following in England than it does here, but it's a really, you know, a first rate little um, rock outfit. Um, little is dismissive. Little rock a, outfit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little is dismissive. It's a really great band. It's, it's a one, great of, band. one of my favorite bands. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't mind to sound, sound like I'm dismissing it. Um, so, you know, the the it's an interesting collaboration. Elton John is, is you know, senior rock personage and, and uh, Jake is a different generation. Uh, it'll be interesting what they do with it. I love Broadway. The energy, the people. There's nothing like it. I'm bringing my new musical, Tammy Faye, to Broadway's gorgeously restored Palace Theatre. It's incredibly special. Sharing this with you here feels like coming home. Tammy Faye herself is a fascinating character. Uh, If you ever have a chance, you should go back and see the TV movie from the 90s that they made about the Bakers with uh, Kevin Spacey and... (laughs) Bernadette Peters as Tammy Faye, and she's like five musical numbers because Tammy Faye used to sing a lot on the shows. So yeah, it's a fun. So you're saying second cast? You're saying Bernadette should come in? (laughs) Bernadette, yes, maybe not Kevin. (laughs) Not Kevin. She she is a great original American character. So here is my look. I I obviously it is professional jealousy or something. Mm. This this issue that I have with British critics. It's it's it <laughs> it should not be taken seriously. However, I do think that they are particularly vulnerable whenever anybody makes fun of Americans. Mm-hmm. They just wriggle with pleasure. It is just like petting a cat. They are the happiest, purringest <laughs> folks if there can be a product that makes Americans look like fools. I am married to a British person. I fully understand <laughs> and experience that same dynamic every day. And so it is, it's just, I, I will say that it makes me trust them. Not, not at all. It doesn't mean that I don't want to see it. Of course, I'm thrilled to see it, but it does make me look askance. I wonder if there's room for both Tammy Faye and Death Becomes Her uh-huh. and then the Queen of Versailles. Uh, talk about camp. Right. There's a lot of... Um, You're talking about the Queen of Versailles uh, starring Kristen Chenoweth. There's a lot of, you know, big women, big hair... Eyelashes. <laughs> well, Broadway Broadway loves big women. I mean, that's the history of Broadway and musicals. Mm-hmm. Uh, Queen of Versailles, I think, has been pushed to next season, yep. maybe because yep. it doesn't want to compete with, with. this one. Uh, and with the other, it's, it's going to be a crazy year for leading ladies in Broadway musicals. We'll get to that later. But the, I mean, the... Uh, I think that those two shows, from what I understand of them, are, are going to be quite different. Um, mm-hmm. So we're, we're, I, I you, think the two shows being yeah. Death Becomes Her, becomes her which you Tammy mentioned Faye. earlier, yeah, yeah. just in terms of gorgeous women mm-hmm. trying to. Uh, I mean, Tennessee is, is a bio, you know, is a bio musical, and Death Becomes Her is a straight up satirical musical comedy. Right, yeah. and it's it's based on a film, I think, a 2009 film. Uh, a 1992 film. I was going to say, <laughs> I was like, oh, excuse me. Yeah. We're all much younger than we think we are. The story of Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn yeah. and Bruce Willis about two women fighting over a man and, a man and uh, taking a potion to keep them eternally young. It wouldn't pass the Bechdel test. Uh, necessarily, because well, they're fighting over it's, them. It, it's not so much that it keeps them young, because their body parts start literally falling off, yeah. but <laughs> that it, it gives them eternal life. Yes. And so um, the body parts may look young, and they may continue to live, but in the movie, that was the fun part of it, that an arm would fall off, or a leg would fall <laughs> off, or the head would screw around. <laughs> Ernest. What's wrong with me? It's a dislocated neck. That's what it is. No, it could happen. I've, I've never seen it happen, but it could happen. So it's going to be fun to see the special how they, effects. Yeah, uh, macabre and also a nerd <laughs> is you know that was how Medea tricked people into jumping into her cauldron, was she would tell them that it would 
Medea, the ancient sorceress <laughs> of old Greek myth, if she said, you know, I can make you young and beautiful, and uh, all you have to do is let me kill you, chop you up, and put put you in my cauldron, and uh, and here, you know, it's a it's a tale as old as time. <laughs> that women are willing to put poison in their bodies so that people will think uh, that they're beautiful. But I mean, I I, I will happily watch that <laughs> with uh, with Megan Hilty and Jen oh. Smart because these are two of the funniest women. In, in, you know, working today in musical yeah. theater. this. You did it. I did it. You two better not do it. The next musical is Anything But Camp, and that is Swept Away. Right, yeah. Uh, opposite of camp. It is the opposite <laughs> of camp. It is an all-male uh, cast. It is a musical based on a 2004 concept album. It is about a uh, shipwreck, a real life shipwreck, of a whaler in the 1880s. 80s. And does involve survival to yes. the point of cannibalism. Yes, well, let's see. Yeah. Plot points. You can't really have a spoiler because it is based on a, on a real event, although it's a real event that people don't talk about that much these days. If you say Donner Party, people know what you mean, and if you say Mignonette, they probably don't. Yeah. Uh, the cast is led by Stark Sands. Yes, and, and it is John directed, Gallagher Jr. And John Gallagher Jr. And John Gallagher. And it's directed by Michael Mir, so it's very, very promising. It's nice sometimes to have just sort of a more simple story. I mean, Bands Visit did that uh, a few years ago where it was really in contrast yes. with a lot of the louder stuff yes. uh, and stood out very well. So, you know, uh, I, I, I like that there's a lot of writing, and I like that it's, it's not quite an original score because it is mostly, I think they wrote one new song for this, but it's mostly from their their past catalog and, and mainly from this one 2004 album. What's really exciting is the new sound of the Yvette Brothers, which is yes. in a long line of new sounds from last season, That's like Pig Pen yes. yeah. in Water yeah. for Elephants and yeah. Jamestown Revival. Yeah, it's sort of a for folk the, rock song. For the outsiders. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yep, sort yep. of sound. Yeah. And also there's hey sort of a background. little bit, maybe I'm projecting or reading in, but there's also sort of a sea shanty yeah, mm -hmm. quality mm -hmm. to uh, to the score, um, and those were really popular. And the whole, uh, it seems to me that this sort of folk music, uh, folk rock music, Americana style of music, is moving into Broadway more and more, and and it's an easier music to adapt for the stage than rock was. Because with rock, it's so loud, you can't hear the lyrics all the time. And in these, you can really sort of hear. And a lot of these bands or these groups that are now writing for the stage are sort of Gen X. And, and that's the audience that is now moving toward uh, the, the becoming um, consumers of Broadway, whereas the baby boomers who were the rock generation are, sorry, fellow boomers, <laughs> moving yeah. on, moving. So um, it's healthy for Broadway. Yeah. It's a good sign. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this one. I, did we, do we all remember the TikTok trend of 2020, mm -hmm. right? Which was sea shanties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, everybody sang she, sea shanties. I can't say it. I can't <laughs> say it. <laughs> it. The shanties. It, how long does it take to develop a musical? Four years. So if you, what's the current TikTok trend? I have no idea. <laughs> but whatever it is, it's what is going to be on Broadway in four years. Well, this was fun for the first part. Thank you very much. We're taking a short break. When we return, we'll look at the Broadway roster of dramas and comedies set for the fall. 
I'm back with critics Adam Feldman and Helen Shaw and journalist Jan Simpson. So, plays, a good dozen are coming our way this fall. Well, Some a dozen. Been... We don't know if they're going to be good. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, let's be positive, Adam. Yeah, no, no. Uh, very, very be positive. Always. Um, <laughs> Some of them have already opened. Job. And it took me a while to realize it's not Job. <laughs> but it was a new play by Max Wolf Friedlich, a two-hander starring Peter Friedman and Sidney Lemon. It's on through October 27th now, so it's in its last weeks. Jan, what did you think of Job? I was a fan. Mm. I liked it. Um, uh, I thought it was a interesting look at internet culture and uh, a good play by a, a young playwright and terrific performances by uh, Peter Friedman and Sidney Lemon, granddaughter of Jack Lemon. She has to review some of the most scabrous, awful, terrible things, which takes a real emotional toll on stuff that's going over the Yeah, I was not as much of a fan. Uh, I really didn't like this play at all. I saw it when it was off-Broadway. Uh, I was surprised that it moved to Broadway. I know it, it had a, a, an audience off-Broadway, and uh, I think that made sense in a kind of a small space where it was a surprise to see actors like uh, Peter Friedman, who's a terrific actor, uh, in such a small space. Uh, on Broadway, I think that the, the problems with the play for me were amplified, um, and it, to me it just felt very manipulative. It's one of those plays where when you think about it afterwards, uh, nothing really makes sense in terms of how it's structured or how they're interacting with each other. Uh, she pulls a gun on him at the beginning of the play yeah. just to to give you a strike. It's a, it's a right. therapy session. She has been, she's on leave for mental breakdown reasons. Uh, she wants to go back to her job. She, he is evaluating, he's a psychiatrist who's evaluating her. She pulls a gun on him at the beginning of the show. Uh, then she puts it back in her bag. And it's one of those, you know, you're watching this bag with the gun in it for the entire show. And there are 20 times when he could grab the gun and overpower her. Like, it, it does, none of the actual, what's actually happening in the show made sense to me. I really disliked this play. Um because I felt that at every level it was dishonest on a plot level, but also, as you say, these are issues that do confront us about whether or not um, the jobs that people do uh, on the internet are, are scarring them mm -hmm. and turning them into mm -hmm. monsters. Uh, but it is, those are, but he has uh, reapportioned that job to a person who would not have it. Uh, and since no element of it makes a lick of sense, it means that any kind of social diagnosis or critique is necessarily sort of invalidated. But, but but um, <laughs> on the bright side, uh, Peter Friedman is getting work. And the, <laughs> the cast of Succession, uh, this beautiful boomerang effect that is happening, which is that the casting agent on Succession, who went to all the best, <laughs> all the best theater actors who have been great heroes to those mm -hmm. of us watching off-Broadway theater and Broadway theater for so long, are now have their own star heft. The idea that you're like, let's open it with Peter Friedman, just, I mean, that in itself is, is a positive. Helen, you mentioned in your review of uh, The Roommate that it kind of descended into camp, talking about camp a little earlier. This, of yeah. course, is the play by Jen Silverman, uh, starring Patty uh, Lupone and Mia Farrow in a very welcome comeback mm -hmm. to Broadway mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. um, what aspect of camp did you find it? So uh, camp means many things to many people. It is a fool's errand to try to define <laughs> it. In, uh, and so I wield it with abandon. So in this case, what I meant by camp is that at one point, Patti Lupone, who is wearing a wig of such horror that it has already created several sort of levels of shock in the viewer, claims that she, Patti Lupone, and I just think everyone should pause and think about Patti Lupone for a second, that she has had in her Bronx past a career as someone who steals cars and that she was really good at <laughs> jacking them and stripping them down. And in this moment, my tether to reality was cut. <laughs> and I thought, we are in space. This is a, <laughs> it's so absurd. It's so poorly 
conceived. <laughs> and the idea that this is reality is just is just gone. And in that moment, because Patty is herself a tremendous persona who is always performing herself, Patty Lupone, the persona, that it that it took on those levels of like, you are in a world where bad and good don't make any sense anymore. Just let go and let God, and you are in the world of camp at this point. Between Patty and Mia Farrow, that represents over 130 years of acting experience on the stage. I thought Mia Farrow was a delight. I wonder if you thought, if you think about the play without those actors in it. I actually do think that Patti Lapone wouldn't have been a terrible, uh, wouldn't have been terrible at stripping cards. <laughs> in and jacking reality. them up. And I think uh, <laughs> Mia Farrow was such a pleasant surprise for me. As this uh, uh, timid uh, Iowa uh, mousy divorcee. Iowa divorcee who uh, discovers a, a, a devil inside of herself with goading from this uh, Bronx, implausible Bronx roommate. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I I've liked some of Mia Farrow's past work, but I never really associated her with uh, being a huge, uh, hugely comic uh, star. I know that her last big Broadway show was romantic comedy in the late 70s, but for me, other than her supporting role in Radio Days, which she's very, very funny in, I hadn't really thought of her as a comedic performer. So this was a very pleasant surprise for me. It was, I thought, a, an expert performance. And so for me, that carried the show, and I was willing to sort of overlook the you know, sort of standard things that I, I didn't love about the play. There's the devil within the character that is in McNeil by the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Ayad Akhtar. And that marks Robert Downey Jr.'s Broadway debut as this Nobel worthy um, novelist who is dealing with AI and some of the temptations I would assume of AI figure in this, as well as the fact that he has an estranged son. They're being very mysterious about it. And they're also talking about some sort of technological representation of Robert Downey Jr. that's going to be on stage. Like a bot or something? No, like a hologram. Like a hologram? hologram? Well, it, although they say not a hologram. I don't want to raise your expectations. Yeah. <laughs> not a hologram. Yeah, it's a projection. Uh, um, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I think Ayad Akhtar is a very interesting mm. playwright. So. I'm intrigued by that. Did by Bart Schur. And, yeah. And I ought to pull a surprise when it was disgraced, which I liked quite a lot. I've liked some of his other work too. It's been, you know, off off Broadway, but I I've liked his work and I'm curious to see what Robert Downey Jr. does on stage. He's a very talented guy, so it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure they're selling tickets like no tomorrow. Uh, given that he's at the peak of his career in many respects, just having well, won an Also, Oscar. if you walk by uh, the stage door underneath Lincoln Center, which is where the show is playing, um, even early previews, mob. There's yeah. just a mob of people, probably people who haven't even paid to see the show, just out there hoping see, to get a glimpse of him. I, I don't know anything about the play. Uh, I, I've, again, deliberately tried to keep myself in the dark about it, so I, I hope that I like it. What I will say is that Robert Downey Jr., I love that he's making his Broadway. First of all, I like that he's coming to Broadway at all. Uh, he is, a, as you say, a, a terrific actor. But also, I love that he's doing it with an original play. Um, by a major American playwright. I think that is bold of him. I mean, I, I'm very happy to see Denzel Washington and, and Julius Caesar and Othello uh, fences, but uh, it's it's lovely to see someone, you know, using their clout to, uh, to bring forward a new work. You know, this is a guy who just won an Oscar, who just signed a deal with Marvel for hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, be in their next pictures. He's taking time out of his uh, very busy schedule <laughs> to, uh, to do a, a new play at Lincoln Center. I think that's great. That might be why it's only on till November yep. 
24. I think any season that has a new play by Ayad Akhtar and Jess Butterworth is a really, really good season. And mm -hmm. something that I'm really looking forward to is The Hills of California, mm -hmm. starring Laura Donnelly, who was also in Jez Butterworth's The Ferryman mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, speaking it's like of- she has some relationship. What's that? <laughs> she, they are in a relationship. They, they are in a yes. relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, speaking of gypsy and stage mothers, this is about a stage mother who grooms her um, Blackpool raised daughters to sort of become an Andrew sisters. And it does take place in the 70s with flashbacks to the 50s and this fractious family dynamic. The Sea View Luxury Guest House and Spa, just around the corner from this cinema. Turn left, I promised Mom. I promised that Joan would be. Straighten up and fly right. My girls are the webs, and the webs aren't ten a penny. They only made one lot, and they are real. Mm -hmm. It's a London import. Mm -hmm. um, did you read any reviews from? I saw it in London. Actually. Oh, you saw it in London. So oh, please. I'm excited to see the the, the transfer because the, they're keeping mostly the women the same, and the the guys have been cast with American actors doing Blackpool accents. So, <laughs> say a prayer. I honestly, I really enjoyed it when I saw it, and. The thing is, is that he is, I don't know, is it is it tacky? Is it old fashioned? Is it sexist to describe a relationship as being a muse at this point? I don't know. I feel like maybe that's kind of retro for me to say, but- Go right ahead. But he is writing for her specific gifts. And The Ferryman, which did not persuade me, honestly, I thought some of it was sort of I, I, like, heidi-dighty-dighty version of Irishness, which I found vaguely kind of irritating. But his work for her in that play was stupendous. And here again, he has written her this role, which is pretty, I mean, it's pretty great. It is pretty great. And, and so she, I'm excited for She's playing a double role, right? Yes. She is. I can say no more. Because, <laughs> she's but, playing but, the mother she, and, right, okay. and oh, another well, character. Yes. And, but, and in fact, it is not just her. The other women who play this sort of suite of sisters, uh, the, the older gang in the 70s, again, there is a thing in which they are trying to convince us that obviously incredibly glamorous people are not glamorous. But mm. hey, it's the Broadway equation. But it is very much worth seeing, and it's great that it's come. Somebody is dying in someone the is, play. And someone isn't going to make is, it. This is the cause of the reunion. Yes. And there is a slight autobiographical element only because Jez Butterworth has spoken openly about her, his sister's dying of brain cancer. And that does figure in this play as well. It is, except it is not, I, I, it is not a play about grief. It is a play about um, uh, pressure. And that is what Jez Butterworth is really, I mean, that is the song he was born to sing. He's, he really likes to apply the pressure. Something that is full out autobiographical or more, more than semi autobiographical is Yellow Face. David Henry Wong's play, it's a revival of a 2007 play that was at the public. You probably saw it there. Mm -hmm. He does put himself in the play in the character of DHH, which is played by Daniel Day Kim, talking about Hollywood stars mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. to Broadway. And it is also jam packed with events that include. Um, first, the yellow face protest that he and B.D. Wong led against the casting of Jonathan Price and Miss Saigon, followed by his monumental 1993 flop face value, followed by a banking scandal that involved his father. So his father is also in the play, Henry Y. Wong. It's not fully autobiographical. It's yes. very like uh, it's quasi, playful. hemi, mm. demi, semi, uh, crypto autobiographical. <laughs> and so, you know, it, he gets to play it both ways. He gets to put his story on stage and also tweak it in whatever manner he wants to uh, heighten the humor and heighten the satire and heighten the meta theatrical aspects of it. It also touches eventually on a, another Asian American story from the period, uh, which like, I won't spoil either. Uh, but the, um, I, I think it's great to have, I like this trend of off-Broadway plays mm. from recent history mm. coming back on Broadway. We've gotten mm. a, a bunch of them mm -hmm. recently. Most recently, yeah. Appropriate was a key mm -hmm. example of this, but also between Riverside and Crazy and, you know, and you Cost like of it Living. Why? It's expanding the nature of what Broadway can do, and it's showing a greater confidence in the American recent canon, okay. where we get these, what we tend to have, the idea is that these smaller, weirder plays can't play on Broadway, that they're mm. only off-Broadway. And then we bring over small, weird plays 
from England and yep. put them on Broadway. Um, so I like the idea of like saying back, you know, how I learned to drive can be on Broadway and yellow face can be on Broadway and let's just see how they work. And, and I think that they can. I saw it at the public as well enjoyed it there. Uh, David Henry Wong enjoys putting himself in his plays. He was in Soft Power. He is in Soft Power. Which um, was a, a few uh, years ago. He he likes that kind of um, Meta, self, as, yeah, as self referential uh, uh, thing. Francis Jew was in it at the public. He's now back in it uh, and, and here. And he's playing Henry uh, Y. Wong, David's father. He was uh, so good off Broadway I, I, in this part, and I can't wait to see him. I know. So now he plays it'll, the father. Funny. Yeah, yeah it'll, funny. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's, it's an enjoyable play. It's not at the top of my list. At the top of my list is the Hills of California. I'm really looking forward to that play. Uh, we had spoken about the fact that it was the fifth revival of Gypsy. We are is now enjoying the fifth revival of Our Town, directed by Kenny Leon. Yeah, but this one's going to be different. This is one is going to be different. How <laughs> yeah. do you suppose it's going to be different? Well, no suppose. <laughs> 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 no suppose. One of the families is going to be a black family. Mm -hmm. Jim Parsons is playing the stage manager. Is playing the stage manager. I don't know how different it's going to be because one of the families uh, is black. Um, and I actually think that would be a good thing in this because the idea is that this is just a town, this is just life, these are just people. And it's important to acknowledge that people who are black or brown or yellow um, are just people. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, I think Kenny Leon may bring that to it. So it's going to be interesting to see. Richard Thomas is also in the play as well as a Katie great Holmes ensemble. Katie is in the play. Uh, a Eugene great Jones. ensemble of actors. I think a lot it of is truly one of the top three plays in the American canon from 1938. It's certainly on. done. It's done. I mean, you know, I mean, I did it in high school. Didn't you do it? <laughs> did anybody I did not do it in high school. Did you do it? Oh, oh, I don't think yeah. when I was in high school anyone wanted to play? see me at yeah. it. Hmm? Who did you play? I was just a dead person. Oh. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But there is that moving moment in the Civil War oh. Cemetery. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but it is that moving moment when the stage manager says they didn't see more than 50 miles of their town, and yet they died because they believed in the United States of America. That, it is that play is full of lines, especially just incidental ones by the stage manager that murder me. Yep. Uh, it is a, uh, like Gypsy, uh, it's, a, it's a show that I'm always happy to see again in a good production. Uh, it is one of the great American plays. It, there's an argument to be made that it is the great American play, uh, if you're going to call something that. Uh, I, 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 my only concern is that the off-Broadway version of it a few years ago at the Bleecker mm. Street, directed by David, that was directed by David Comer, was so great that it almost felt definitive to me in a way that I I don't know how anything can top it. But it's not fair to the other thing is it's not fair to to make that comparison. You know, it doesn't need to top it. It just needs to do something else that's interesting and that's good and worth seeing. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing it again. It is a weird play. Because people yes, do it yes. in high school, people think, oh, it's just like the standard Americana. It's not. It's, not. it's a very weird experimental it's play. It is still and experimental. It is, it yes. is weird. Jed Harris directed the original production yes. in 1938. Yes, and Wilde wrote it uh, to break with what was on Broadway at the time. He wanted it to be um, an experiment. His best friend was yeah. Gertrude Stein. Yes. I mean, this yes. was the yep. person yes. who was That's in right. modernist yep. letters, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. really yeah. making waves. So I teach a class, which a uh, modern US drama class, in which, which means I read this play every year. And I, it is a, I, I honestly approach it as though it is a spiritual discipline. I think that when we talk about shows coming back, I think that returning to texts is actually a genuinely important thing that, that if you see 
uh, Hamlet when you are 20, when you are 30, and when you are 40. It isn't just part of your life as entertainment. It's also part of your sort of education as a person. And I feel that way about our town. And I will also say that every year that I read it, I make the extremely stupid choice to read it on the subway, on my phone, which means that I am crying my uh. face off <laughs> at 41st Street as we pull into the station, mm. and it's humiliating. But it is, uh, yeah, I... I kind of think, you know, they should just give free tickets to everybody. This is what everybody should see this show. On a totally different note, Left on 10th, a romantic <laughs> comedy by Delia Efron's sister of Nora Efron, and directed by Susan Stroman, a romantic comedy starring Peter Gallagher and Juliana Margulies. It is to some extent about grief because she is mourning her sister's death and also <laughs> her husband's death. And, but it is about second chances. And it is second chances about the baby boomers that you brought up, Jan. Um, and so they're in their 70s, and love doesn't die. We're all happy to note. There's uh, no way the characters are in their 70s. They're playing by Juliana Marcus. I was Juliana oh, Marcus is just not playing someone in her oh, 70s. I guess, I guess I stand corrected. <laughs> no, you Juliana. are correct. The characters are in their 70s. But originally, but I'm as sure it's, it's, been the, it's the down. opposite of the roommate, where yes. the characters I think were written in their fifties, and yes. now they're being played, played, played by, by women in their seventies. So they've yeah. made the characters in their sixties uh, uh, sort of meet in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Juliana Margulies run across the street, right? Play. Maybe they could do a little switchy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, I think it sort of seems to be cut from the same cloth, maybe as the roommate. Uh, and uh, as you say, it's it's appealing to boomers who are a lot of the audience for Broadway plays or the intended audience for these plays. Uh, and uh, both of these plays seem to be saying, hey, you're not dead yet. And for going from lovers in their, <laughs> you know, going from, uh, from lovers in their, in their 70s to lovers in their teens who do die. And that is yeah. Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> the tiniest moves you make, the whole thing. Directed by Sam Gold, sorry, Rachel Zegler, who was Maria in the film of West Side Story and English Heartthrob. Do we Kit technically know how Connor. old Romeo is? He's 16 and she's 14. 14. And Wait, is, is he established? Where did I get that? I, I don't, don't know. know. I thought well, we I, what I my head that he's 21. She's, she, she's there's 14. There's text that says yeah. she's, she's 14. Turned, yeah. So, what does the plus sign in the title? mean to it's modern. Uh, it it's, means that it's cool and now yeah. uh, that it is down with the kids and that it is giving modern um i i it also though is starring not just rachel zegler who has basically played this part by playing maria it's also starring kit o'connor who is one of the heartthrobs from connor. kit kit connor did i add an o yeah, yeah. well oh kit connor <laughs> kit connor um <laughs> is uh, one of the heartthrobs from heartthrob isn't it Heartstopper. Heartstoppers. Heart That's right. So I watched a trailer, which I have not seen Heartstoppers, but I have I have watched uh, the trailer, <clears throat> and I have also a friend who is obsessed with it. And the 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 news that Kit Connor is going to be this romantic heartthrob has has made a certain wave in a certain community, and I think <laughs> it's going to anyway. It, it should sell well. And we'll, your understanding. We'll see if the next play, Cult of Love, by Leslie. Headland, Headland, mm -hmm. yeah, is uh, is a big swing or not? It, yeah. it it does sound fascinating though. It is about a fractious family of evangelicals that are gathering. It's directed by Trip Coleman. It does feature Zachary Quinto among an ensemble of young actors. I counted six Broadway debuts in this play, um, and it is the Doll family who uh, have to deal with lesbianism, <laughs> denial, dementia, addiction. <laughs> a wayward son and a lesbian daughter. So there you go. Uh, it sounds like it's uh, a stirring the pot quite a lot. Was it done before? Do you know? Uh, no, I think this is the first uh, time. But uh, but but Trip Coleman and Leslie Headland have collaborated many times before. Mm -hmm. In her breakthrough play, uh, Bachelorette, I think he did exactly what was needed for that show. And uh, that was, uh, she's a very pointed mm -hmm. writer. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> She, you know, she she also she co-developed um, Russian Doll, the TV show with uh -huh. uh, Natasha, and I think that her sensibility is uh, very. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, uh, spiky. Acerbic. Uh, acerbic. And uh, it'll be interesting to see it on Broadway. This is the first time that she's on a, in a Broadway house. But Trip Cullman can, you know, did with significant other, for example, he can take modern comedic uh, stories and, and build them up so that they can fill that stage. I think, and having people like Zach Quinto and Shailene Woodley, who's in it, who's a big name star, will help bring people in again to a, a new play. We've talked Great about idea. these very contemporary themes, like AI, like, uh, you know, the internet and job. And there's another one in terms of the anti-vax uh, controversy uh. that affects Eureka Day by Jonathan Spector, directed by Anna Shapiro, about how a community in California is torn apart when there is a mumps outbreak and people take sides. This was another show that was off-Broadway a few mm -hmm. years ago. Yes. Uh, Did you I, see it? I really liked it off-Broadway. I thought it was great fun. It was at Soho Rep, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so a quite small house. It'll be great to see it. It's, it the, the issues are as meaningful today as they were then, if not more. More. Uh, they, uh, it, it, it's a very sharp-minded show. Uh, deals very well with some of these issues of not just vaccination, but also sort of liberalism and the limits thereof and uh, free speech and uh, the internet speech culture. Um, and this it's, it's assembled a completely new and terrific cast. Jan, did you see yeah. it? I did. Uh, and and this cast, will it be the same cast? No. no. Uh, this no. cast yeah, is totally Jessica Hex, is... Amber Gray, Bill Irwin. What did you think of the play? Oh, I loved it off-Broadway. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it has a, it has one of my favorite comic strategies in it, which is the projection of text. Mm -hmm. Because for some reason, and I don't know why this is true, reading printed language on stage is inherently funny. And so if someone says something and then you see next to them, she didn't mean it, printed out on a little screen, it is uproarious. And they, and this is, if they get the choreography of that right in this, it is, it is gonna be a barn burner. Let the record show that we started this conversation with you two dumping on oh, yeah, we were mean. And now mm -hmm. we're ending this conversation almost with you two praising Eureka Day. So Eureka. We do and, like things. <laughs> we like a lot of things. <laughs> and Chan, I'm with you. I'm totally with you. But. We started out the whole discussion with uh, the, the comedy of Oh, Mary. Mm -hmm. And the last thing on the list here is All In, a comedy about love by Saturday Night Live's Simon Rich, featuring also a terrific a cast. Frank directed, Rich. <laughs> also a Frank Rich fame. <laughs> uh, 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 Frank Rich's yeah. son. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. So he has a background in the theater, but he's also, he's a terrific comic writer. Such a writer. funny writer. Uh, and this is, this is pieces that I think he originally wrote for The New Yorker uh, and that are being done on stage in some way. It'll be a rotating cast. Uh, they're leading off with a really strong team. It's but John Mulaney and Richard Kind and, you know. Renee uh, Ellis. Fred Armisen. Goldsberry, yeah. the Bengsons, Fred Armisen, um, directed the Bengsons by. Bengsons will be doing songs by the magnetic field. So it just a, it looks like a fun time. Alex Timber's directing. It yeah. certainly does seem like a, a holiday spirit in, in spades. Limited um, run, like 10 weeks or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and rotating cast. Yeah. So I'm glad we're ending on this. Thank you so much for um, joining us again. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you another time, perhaps midway through the season. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with creative artists who live only to astonish us. Be sure to download the new CUNY TV app to watch all our shows, also available on YouTube. I'm Patrick Pacheco.